Hello everyone, a very good afternoon to all our esteemed guests today. Thank you so much for coming here today and to have our this roundtable on the changing dynamics of the Middle East implications for Bangladesh. Now, I would like to request Mr. A.N.M. Munir Zaman, President of BIPS, and Mr. Zafar Sobhan, Editor of the Dhaka Tribune, to give their welcome remarks and to moderate the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Saba. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon to all of you. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Bangladesh Institute of Peace and Security Studies and our co-host, the Dhaka Tribune, to this afternoon's roundtable on the changing dynamics of the Middle East and the implications for Bangladesh. This is our series of roundtables and discussions that we hold every month on key strategic issues and events. And today we are looking at a very critical region of the world, the Middle East. The Middle East had inherited a power structure and a geographical identity from its colonial masters that sowed the seed of discontent, instability, and conflict. Living behind questionable borders, dissatisfies ethnic minorities, which ultimately fuel state and non-state actors to challenge the existing state and territorial sovereignty. More recently, we saw a large segment of the Arab youth who were dissatisfied with the status quo, which led to the Arab Spring and the ongoing turmoil and instability in the region continues. The region is sensitive and important to all of us for a number of issues and points, from geostrategic viewpoint, geoeconomic viewpoints, issues of geoenergy, issues of geoethnicity, and these are all critical issues also important to Bangladesh. But what is more important today is that a number of challenges face the region, which makes it even more critically unstable at times. We are witnessing the almost perhaps the last phase of the Syrian civil war, which is completely changing the power dynamics not only in Syria, but also in the region. We are seeing the ongoing humanitarian crisis and a conflict in Yemen. We are certainly watching and very observant of the issues of the Palestine, which is also very close to our heart in Bangladesh. The international community has consistently failed the rights and aspirations of the Palestine people. And that is a critical issue we must address. The occupation of Palestine land must end. We are also witnessing the current role of Iran in the region and the prospect of reviving JCPOA. The ongoing instability in Lebanon and the possibility of spillover into the region and beyond is also a possibility. So therefore, we are also watching carefully on the possible flashpoints in the region, like the states of Hormuz, or a possible preemptive strike on Iranian nuclear facilities. More recently, the role of Saudi Arabia in shaping the Middle Eastern politics, and in particular, very recent resetting of the US Saudi Arabia relations, and the possibility of MBS rising again as a power broker is a question to address. We are seeing israel uae relations developing rapidly, so therefore we must watch carefully the future of the Abraham Accords in the region. On the geoeconomic front, which our good professor Abbasi will address to you, there are a number of issues that need to be addressed, particularly the worrying factor of energy transition in the region and how that might affect not only of energy transition, 
but economic transition with its possible pitfalls and fallouts. The current China's entry into the Middle Eastern politics and into the energy politics of the region is a factor to watch. Climate change certainly is a major challenge to the region, so therefore issues of water security will determine much of the future of the region, and we should also be watching the next COP, COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt carefully. So there is a large number of issues to be addressed, and we have a very distinguished panel today. Unfortunately, one of our panel members, Mr. Shamsher Mabin Chaudhary, the former Foreign Secretary, has fallen sick with COVID-19 and is unable to attend. But nevertheless, we have two distinguished speakers who will be amply covering all the issues that I briefly mentioned. With that introduction, I will now hand over to Professor Lailufar Yasmin, a professor of international relations at Dhaka University, a well-known author and a writer, and a distinguished IR specialist in Bangladesh. So, Dr. Yasmin, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, sir, for this very generous introduction. But when it comes to Middle East, I know like it is a trap waiting for any of us uh, trying to make any comment. Um, I studied, uh, I actually initially specialized on Middle East back uh, when I was a student of master's and then realized that at the end of the day people would like to learn from you about your own region, not any other region. So then I moved back to South Asia. Uh, but then as Sir mentioned at the beginning that Middle East is connected with Bangladesh's existence, Bangladesh's development and Bangladesh's politics because of the uh, unique democracy and other characteristics that we cannot turn a deaf eye when we are talking about Middle East, uh, 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 turn a deaf eye to the issues, the uh, challenges that are uh, happening in the Middle East. Uh, not only is because we need to ensure our energy security, but also because of uh, the socio-cultural and religious affinity that we have uh, with the uh, region of, uh, with different countries of Middle East. So here, uh, you know, first, what do we understand by Middle East? This is a question that often, uh, even when uh, back in uh, 90s when I studied, we, we failed to define what is Middle East because Middle East itself, we, we think it is a very uh, a sort of, uh, you know, it's a, it's a unified region. It is not. Uh, that is the first idea we need to take because uh, when I was, uh, you know, going through the details of Lebanon, for example, you see how the governance structure is based on recognizing uh, neutrality to religion. So we often think it is, uh, you know, one religion driven uh, a region, but that is not the case that was not the case in the case of governance uh, power sharing in the case of Iraq previously so there's a lot of diversity there uh, however when from uh, being a Bangladeshi from Bangladesh's perspective we often tend to see is being dominated by only one religion and uh, uh, from uh, the through uh, with which we have uh, we feel we have a deeper connection but as I'll discuss today, in fact, initially I was supposed to talk about Iran and some other areas, but now, uh, you know, the area expanded due to, unfortunately, Shamshe Mubin uh, Chaudhuis are uh, being affected by, uh, infected by COVID. Uh, so first, let me start with uh, Iran, um, Saudi Arab, and the geopolitical game. Um, okay, uh, in the case of any countries of the world, they have certain strategic interest and such certain tactical interest. So what do I mean by strategic interest? Strategic interest is the long-term goal uh, and objective laid out uh, by a country um, and tactical objectives are uh, the procedural matters through which a country uh, sort of uh, realizes its broader goals uh, so in the case of uh, any other in any other like any other countries of the world uh, uh, whether we are talking about Saudi Arabia whether we are talking about UAE or uh, uh, Iran strategic primary strategic objective is to ensure sovereign and territorial integrity. So that is the primary objective. So whenever we are uh, talking about any countries of the world, we must have to take into account that it is based on that particular perspective. What I think my security interest, the way I think that my survival would be ensured, that is the best way for me to pursue my foreign policy in relation to other countries. So in the case of Iran, we can see that it has first 
first and foremost uh, uh, strategic objective of maintaining its sovereignty, territorial integrity, which comes from an extremely realist uh, uh, aspiration. But often, uh, in the case of Iran, as I'll come later, that um, Iran's foreign policy is not only guided by realist assumption of uh, uh, main, uh, you know, say, maintaining its territorial integrity, but also guided by a very constructivist idea, because it is driven also by the uh, uh, driven by the aspiration to maintain certain identity. Um, so identity and its uh, you know territorial integrity, both of them together, um, you know, uh, create a sort of uh, its uh, its foreign policy overture in the long run. Um, so a number of scholars, as I was going through some recent materials as well as some earlier materials, um, often export of uh, uh, we uh, tend to uh, think or we tend to argue that export of revolution is one of the cornerstone of Iranian foreign policy, but over the years it has changed. It's, it's because of contemporary international politics, because it's the uh, it's a time when the ideologies don't work the way it used to work during uh, the Cold War period. Export of revolution does not work with many countries. Many countries, they want rather uh, um, a sort of export of goods, export of connections, export of you know resources. So Iranian foreign policy often, uh, from the very uh, contemporary prism, uh, we need to change change our mindset that it is always based on export of revolution, rather it is also based on uh, export of its resources, goods, its, its ideas, because now we do not go for, you know, direct sort of, you know, uh, exporting of uh, revolution or uh, sort of ideologies, but also you want to use your soft power, your soft tools to sort of infiltrate in a, in a society in a manner so that your ideas receive a consent. So in South Asian dialectics, we call it not through coercion, but through consent. So uh, to, uh, you know, even if it's later, many other countries of the world, they are increasingly understanding the need to follow kind of South Asian dialectics, although the, it is not widely acknowledged as a South Asian dialectics, not through coercion, but through consent. So this is some of the strategic ideas that guide uh, Iranian foreign policy. What are the tactical foreign policy? I'll go to a little bit uh, details later. But tactical one, number one, presenting itself to, uh, before the world as a peaceful nation. So that is, uh, you know, through uh, maintaining a kind of um, uh, friendly relations with all countries of the world through committing to JCPOA, that is joint, um, okay, J you know what it is, a joint commission, um, um, plan of action, uh, joint commission for plan of action, uh, the nuclear deal. So whatever the government is in Iran, it considers JCPOA as a part of its national strategy. It's not only an international mechanism, but this is considered as a national uh, guideline for Iran to sort of uh, engage with the broader international community. Uh, number two, the tactical, uh, you know, sort of policies uh, connecting with Europe, connecting with EU, connecting with Western nations so that its trade um, is, is uh, less hampered. Number three, uh, priority of getting sanctions lifted. Uh, so, and number four, connecting with the rest of the world. So here we can see that <clears throat> A number of ways that uh, uh, current regime is, is uh, trying to do that. That while previous governments' uh, sort of uh, policies were influenced by liberalism, we can see Rice's government, the current government, its policies is rather guided by a mixture, a blend of realism and pragmatism uh, from very higher, coming from higher background, so from a very higher sort of background. So, uh, for example, a number of uh, you know arguments made by uh, the current uh, sort of uh, regime is that we will not tie the Iran people's interest to the nuclear deal only, but we will tie people's interest in a larger context. So this has been some of the you know, statements made by Iranian government uh, over, over time and time and again. So at the same time, Iranian government has been quite skeptical, especially after American withdrawal from the JCPOA, because it shows that how there can be lack of consistency in American foreign policy, which I'll, I'll discuss a little later in relation to EU-American relations. So therefore, uh, West, uh, as we have seen, uh, is often seen through the prism of American leadership. Uh, we can see in last several years that a relationship has changed uh, 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 in a number of ways. So Iranians have started to identify this fissure in in the West, within the West, that America has always, America is always driven by its particular interest, while Europe 
or EU, the 27 nations, they are driven by their particular interests. Although, remember, EU does not yet have a common foreign policy. Uh, so therefore, they are interested to pursue this, this particular area, and they are interested to uh, uh, sort of ensure their entry to uh, the West via European Union, rather than relying solely on America. Uh, and then what one of the other areas is that um, we are, you know, often when we are talking about Middle East or any part of the world, we are forgetting this is 21st century, 2022, and 21st century is largely called as Easternization of the world. So everything, you know, we call it trade, we call it arms race, we call it, call, uh, call it uh, you know, the bigger power play, it is coming to Asia or it is Asia centric. So here we can see Iran in its tactical sort of policies have made two other, identi uh, identified two other issues. Number one, pivot to Asia. So it's not only something that Obama administration started, but Iranians are seriously considering that there is a world outside of the West. So therefore we need to look into, so they have formulated their pivot to Asia policy as well as a resistance economy, an economy that can survive in the face of you know, sanctions. Uh, for example, there is um, another very interesting statement by former uh, foreign minister, uh, Mr. Zawad, uh, Zarif, that Iran consider e, uh, that it has a PhD in the area of sanction busting. So it is, it is interesting how the metaphor is used in the case of, you know, how to create a resistance economy. Uh, so we can see that, um, you know, that uh, uh, when Iran is talking about pivot to Asia, as I mentioned, that it does not consider the West, East, West as the only getaway for its entry or access to international politics and therefore uh, its pivot to Asia policy is seriously based on connection with South Asia, connection with China. So here uh, you can see that how uh, it is cooperating in the military sector, in the energy sector, in the resource exchanges with China. So Last year, they signed a 25-year um, uh, cooperation agreement, which is aimed at strengthening economic and political relations. Uh, then there were three joint drills um, among three, three countries, China, Russia, and Iran, last of which took place in 2019. So often, scholars have argued, you know, if you look at the articles published in early 2022, scholars at one side, they have called it an illusionary attack, a myth of uh, friendly relations, among these three countries, Russia, China, and Iran. Often, on the other hand, scholars have argued, no, there is something in it. And especially with the Ukraine issue, uh, we need to seriously look at how Iran is sort of uh, connecting with China, Iran is connecting with Russia, and how the geopolitical scenarios and calculation might change. Uh, so in this pivot to Asia, Iran is also, also thinking about Asianization of Asia, that is Asian countries should focus on developing their relationship and the, uh, deepening their relationship amongst each other instead of looking for trade um, and, and businesses with the Western countries because Western countries foreign policy according to Iranian, a number of Iranian scholars that they have not been consistent, especially in the 21st century. So once again, we go back to that era of the, of the Cold War when uh, there was a semblance of a, a sort of a peace uh, which we call called cold peace, and therefore uh, countries were uh, able to see who belongs to which bloc, but it is no longer there. And the fissure in international order also shows that we need a responsible power to which countries can go in times of crisis, but that, it, that is not happening. And therefore, countries are, some countries in, in, in Asian continent, they're thinking, no, it's time for us to create a sort of a third force where we can look after ourselves. So, we can see that when it comes to um, Iran and Saudi Arabian relationship, um, well up to, you know, before 2005, uh, uh, the late king of uh, um, Saudi Arabia, Abdullah, and um, uh, when uh, Rafsanjani was prime minister of uh, uh, Iran, we could see that there was a thaw in relationship between Iran and Saudi Arabia, and that is before Ahmadinejad uh, took over in 2005. But gradually we have seen that the relationship have only soured uh, because both of the countries they see themselves as as uh, champions of a particular uh, sort of sect of uh, Islam and that actually created a number of issues that created a number of um, you know, sort of uh, um, sort of areas of conflict between the two countries. So here we can see that from the perspective of Iran, 
two issues that it considers as non-negotiable. Number one is ballistic missile program. Number two, backing of its allies in the Middle Eastern region. So these two areas Iran considers is non-negotiable um, and um, uh, it is a cornerstone of its foreign policy. Uh, so there are a number of other crises that you know um, I'm going to talk about today. Sar mentioned about um, Saudi Arabia um, and uh, you know uh, how it is uh, regaining its importance. Yes, when uh, the democracy summit took place, uh, I know there was a lot of uh, sort of uh, talks here that who are the countries became a part of this democracy summit. Um, but gradually, we have seen that uh, the 2022 has uh, changed a lot of uh, geopolitical as well as ideological considerations. Now we can see because of uh, the looming or the ongoing en energy crisis, the role of Saudi Arabia and role of the countries who can provide cheaper uh, energy to different countries. This is being uh, uh, this is coming, uh, you know, being very significant for uh, for a number of countries. Therefore, it is only logical that Saudi Arabia will regain, as we have seen in 1970 uh, during the 1974 Arab-Israeli War. Uh, after that, we have seen cars were just lying around, and now we can see, uh, thanks to Facebook, thanks to people making uh, memes, uh, we can see how people are actually going back to you know those eras, and uh, they are uh, taking advantage of their either making a dog cart or making a horse cart in America and they are saying that okay we, we don't have a, you know this is an era of not COVID but uh, you know car price uh, uh, COVID, um, energy prices COVID. So we can see that how these things are going on. So it is only natural. For Bangladesh, we have to be really careful because we know that, uh, um, you know, often when we talk about IR, we forget that uh, there is an economic aspect of it. So in Bangladesh, we have uh, only two oil refineries so far. Um, and these refineries are, uh, they, they use a particular type of, they can refine a particular type of crude oil that originate from the Middle Eastern region. Region. So for Bangladesh, this is a very important area that we need to have a, a, a stronger relationship with Middle Eastern countries because uh, 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 that way we can, uh, you know, uh, refine oil some here. But we have to also remember that how uh, with time, like uh, initially we have Eastern refinery and then uh, there was a second one, I forgot the name of that one, but um, we can only uh, sort of refine a particular sort of oil coming from the Middle East. So for us, there, the strategic importance is extremely high to maintain a particular relationship with Bangladesh. That we have seen back in 1971 when uh, Bangladesh had to go through an unfortunate politics of uh, misrecognition and gradually how we sort of tied our uh, you know, different kind of relationship with these countries, with Middle Eastern countries. So. In, in, in the case of Lebanese crisis, um, we all know that how it is uh, an economic crisis and ultimately uh, what happened is that the government started borrowing 495% against its, its uh, GDP, uh, that uh, GDP it could produce. So it gradually went to a, a level that um, its political st uh, stability, its economic stability, and uh, uh, where, uh, where about 6.5 million people, I think around 6.5 million people only live in Lebanon, but how this has gradually gone to which uh, provides us uh, with a new kind of understanding that a lot of crisis, economic crisis got even worse with the onset of, they coincided with the onset of COVID. So there is no way that you would push back because everywhere there is a contraction of their internal economy uh, and that has affected. So Strait of Hormuz is another sort of possible hotspot uh, in the region where 35% uh, of all crude oil shipped by sea and one third of all LNGs, liquefied uh, natural gas, that pass through the strait. So any uh, sort of um, um, uh, sort of uh, conflict in that area involving Iran, uh, that will have a huge impact on global oil supply, energy supply chain. Uh, so then, sir, can I have the... Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, there are uh, sort of other um, uh, number of crises. For example, uh, Iraq. So why we are talking about Iran and Saudi Arabia now? So after 2003, when um, you know after the American invasion to Iraq and Afghanistan, we have seen that Iraq, its role as a regional power, it, it there, there's no chance of you know regaining that role. And therefore, what happened is that now uh, regional power, uh, if we if we can call that way, uh, Saudi Arab and Iran stands. So uh, 
uh, with the uh, uh, post-election turmoil in Iraq, with the, the way Iraq's internal sort of uh, uh, governance structure and management is being affected, uh, we can find that uh, a number of um, sort of um, sort of gaps there. Uh, so, in the case of Palestine, um, uh, well. It can take a whole another session only to talk about Palestine and, and the way uh, this issue is uh, going on. But um, um, I will not go to much detail as um, His Excellency is here. But what uh, I'll, ha I'll sort of add that the way it is going and the way we have seen the uh, violation of human rights there uh, by the occupied forces and um, uh, whatever we are looking at, there is no solution can be acceptable except for our equitable and something that reflects the wishes of the people who live there. So that is a, not only a Bangladeshi position, that uh, I mean, Bangladesh state's position, that is, I think, position of anyone who is talking about human rights. So we have seen recently how the issue of human rights is sort of applied selectively. So we have selective remembrance, we have selective forgetfulness, uh, we have selective application of human rights. But this is one of the area, if you are talking about uh, uh, government by the people, for the people, and of the people, we have to also talk about a state uh, and its reflection in international politics of the people, by the people, and for the people. Uh, but there, one other thing we need to remember that often we talk about what is the role of the international community. And this is, I think, I, I also mentioned in a number of you know, other programs that my first year students, especially, they often ask me, Madam, where is the map of international community? Because when it comes to these particular you know, issues, often we say there is no international community. Uh, I know one of the members uh, of international community is here. So we see now there's an issue-based formulation of international community, but the overall, uh, the, the way we have seen, although there are many critics of the, of the of Cold War, but during the Cold War period, we have at least seen a semblance of paying attention to issues, but this is something we are missing. So Pisa in the international order is something we need to address when we are talking about uh, you know, Middle Eastern issues. So um, I, th I think um, it's time that you know, I'll, I'll be happy to answer um, any question that you have, but uh, because uh, I was not supposed to address a number of issues, um, so I'm not going into details of those. Thank you. Thank you, Lalufar. You give us a broad picture of the crisis issues that engulf the region. But it is also important for uh, us to understand that it is also a very sensitive area geoeconomically. It is not only geoeconomics, it is geoenergy that makes the Middle East extremely important to the rest of the world and particularly to Bangladesh, which is completely energy import dependent. It is also Bangladesh that is also heavily dependent on our migrant workers who work in the Middle East. The numbers would be 6.5 to 7 million. So therefore, it's a primary source of Bangladesh's foreign exchange earning. So the economic issues of the Middle East are extremely sensitive and important not only to the rest of the world, but also in particular to Bangladesh. So therefore, our next speaker is Assistant Professor Pervez Karim Abbasi from the Department of Economics of East West University, who is a very well-known geoeconomic specialist. Of late, he's also a very well-known face in the Bangladeshi television screens. So therefore, we should be happy to hear him and get his assessment and explanation of some of the critical issues that I mentioned at the beginning. It's always a difficult act after Professor Lailufer, but I will endeavor as a layman to try to come up with some explanation on Middle East and how it affects Bangladesh. So let me give you a quick outline of how this discussion hopefully is going to proceed. First of all, there will be an introduction on Middle East, things that we know but we may not know of. Number two is, how is the Middle East coping with post-fossil fuel transition strategy? Number three, we'll be looking into the economic impact of Ukraine-Russia conflict. And number four, we'll be looking into the geopolitics of Middle East and the involvement of the great powers, namely United States of America, Russia, and increasingly Russia, uh, increasingly China, and how the regional powers such as Saudi Arabia, Iran, Israel, or Turkey are playing or influencing uh, the fabric of Middle East. Last but not the least, we'll be looking into how Middle East affects Bangladesh. 
So these are the broad five areas, rather ambitious, and I've already used up one minute. Now, the term Middle East itself is a contradiction. Why? Because it is one of the oldest civilization spots in the world, whether you talk about the Tigris-Euphrates basin, starting from the Sumerian civilization, whereby modern idea of a city-state or modern governance or how we keep time, anything and everything that influences how the modern world thinks about itself, governs itself, comes from the Middle East. That's number one. Number two, it is the birthplace of four of the oldest monotheistic religions that are still extant. Number one, Judaism. Number two, Zoroastrianism, which is still there. Number three, Christianity. And number four, Islam. So, in terms of coming up with revolutionary ideas that influences people from around, all around the world, the Middle East is a fertile hotbed of new ideas. So it's a crucible of new ideas. Yet, this is the tragedy of Middle East because the term Middle East itself is a Western innovation. In fact, it was coined by an American admiral, which is Alfred Thayer Mahan, and again, he coined the term Middle East because he wanted to project again America's naval power vis-a-vis -vis Middle East. And the modern Middle East map that we see is also an outcome of imperial colonial design, namely the Sykes-Pico Agreement. So it's in itself a contradiction, an ancient civilization which is now defined by Western constructs. And herein lies the dichotomy. Now let me give you a few salient points about Middle East, just to make the points sink in. It is home to 5.2% of the world's global population. Yet it contains 55% of the world's oil reserves and nearly 28% of the world's gas reserves. So you can already see. Just for a small intervention, would you include Iran and Turkey in the Middle East? For, for the time being, we are right now, when we are talking about Middle East, we will be basically including also. Uh, Turkey and Iran, as we are going to go over here, or else the discussion will not be complete. And also NA, also North Africa, too, Middle East and North Africa, it will be used interchangeably. But that's a very reasonable interjection. So coming back to this, it contains only 5% of the world's population, yet controls over 50% of the world's uh, petroleum reserves, and 28%, nearly 28% of the world's gas reserves. So you realize that again, why the Middle East continues to remain relevant, especially so after the Russian-Ukrainian conflict, which has had a massive impact on global fossil fuel supply. Along with this, it is also home to some of the highest income inequalities in the region, whereby only 10% of the population, the 10, top 10% 10 of the population, enjoys 61% of the regional wealth. So this is the highest income disparity in the entire world. So you can already see the fault lines that are coming over here. In terms of the youth demographics, as referred to by General Munir, if you talk about the 15 to 29 year age demographics, 33.3% of the population are within that age group. And if you consider the 0 to 15 age group, so if you consider from say 0 to 29 years age, it's about two thirds of the population uh, count of Middle East and North Africa. And we are, of course, including, in this case, Turkey and Iran. Now, in terms of previous generations, the standard of living has improved, life expectancy has improved, and also educational status has also improved. Along with this, you have digital penetration. Now, in terms of digital penetration, countries like Qatar, countries like Bahrain, countries like Oman have 100% smartphone penetration. And in terms of YouTube videos, the second most YouTube videos that are created and watched are in the Middle East. So you can already realize that the digital platform is a very important conduit in terms of spreading ideas or in terms of spreading political agitation. And in fact, the Arab Spring of 2010-11 shows us that the digital platform, the digital media comes very important in terms of coming up with propaganda or in terms of mobilizing people against state or regional uh, entities. So again, along with this, so wh why have I said all of those things in the introduction? Because this is a volatile mix. And when we have a question on our mind whether an Arab Spring too can take place, all the ingredients are there if the governments are not careful and if there are no 
bigger exogenous shocks. Now going now to the post-fuel fossil fuel transition. So that takes care of the introduction, whereby you know now the importance of the Middle East. Now, if you talk about the post-fossil fuel transition, we often think that, oh, the Middle Eastern countries are filled with, uh, and again, pardon to my, all my Middle Eastern counterparts, many of us think erroneously, and it's a fallacy, that the Middle Eastern countries are backward looking, dependent on the West, and they don't have any idea about what to do in the future. They're just sitting on their fossil fuel reserves, but that's wrong. Countries such as UAE, Qatar, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Oman, to large degree have been preparing for a post-fossil fuel uh, world. Because if you take the report of McKinsey, for example, by 2030, the demand for fossil, fossil fuel will plateau. And at least 50% of our electricity generation will be coming from renewable energy. So as a result, many of these Middle Eastern countries have invested significant amount of time and resources and money in order to go for a post-fossil fuel world. This will become very important when we're talking about the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Now, if you look at this, for example, UAE, it has taken a 360-degree comprehensive reform from agriculture to bankruptcy laws to basically make it, uh, make it more resilient in the 21st century when it's not relying on its oil resources. If you talk about Saudi Arabia, it is, it is in research building the world's largest carbon capture and storage facility, which, which it is going to basically uh, use as oil, uh, as, as f uh, for feed fuel for basically firing up aluminum and petrochemical products. Similarly for Qatar, similarly for Oman. I'll not go into the various projects that are done because that will take up a lot of time, but that means ambitious programs and projects are underway. But along with this comes the pain of liberalization. Because let's say if you take it in case of countries such as uh, Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman has been unpopular for various reasons. But one thing that he did was institute income tax, unheard of in Saudi Arabia before, value added tax, and utility bills in Saudi Arabia. And also, he is trying to reform the pension system and also trying to raise the level of skilled workforce in the Middle East to cope with the demands for the 21st century. Similarly, you see the case in other Middle Eastern countries which are moving away from fossil fuel dependence. Now that, so see, what we had was that the Middle Eastern countries were moving in one direction and they were almost trying to be, and one of the reasons why we see in the West or especially in the United States of America, there was growing wariness to be entangled in the Middle Eastern never ceasing conflicts. Why? Because the idea was fossil fuel was becoming less relevant. China was stepping into a big way. India was stepping into a big way. And in fact, China has become Middle East's biggest trading partner. Russia has become a net security provider for the region because of its intervention in Syria or because of, again, alleged Russian involvement in Libya. So again, the idea is that Russia is also looked forward to or looked uh, towards to by many of the Arab countries where we, you don't have that Cold War mindset that the US is our friend and the Soviet Union is our enemy. So Russia has become also very important over there. But all of a sudden, lo and behold, now you have the Ukraine-Russian conflict and that has caused massive supply chain disruptions. And as a result, now what we see that the people who were considered pariahs once upon a time, like Mohammed bin Salman or Mohammed bin Zayed, now the US administration led by President Biden is quoting them. And in fact, I believe he's due in the region very soon. So how does that change the geopolitics of the Middle East? And what is the compulsion of the West? Because the West is also moving away from fossil fuel dependence. So if we look into this, one of the reasons why you see over here that the Nord Stream 2, the lifeline to Europe, that has been basically scrapped. So, and because Europe depends on diesel fuel, and the US depends on gasoline, so right now Russia is rerouting many of its uh, targeted or gas supply, which was meant for the European market, to China and India. So as a result, what happens is, there is a reliance on Saudi Arabia and UAE as the swing producers to supply more oil. But easier said than done, because right now what has happened is due to COVID, 
there has been a gradual decline in demand. Because if you have social shutdown, if you have a lockdown, people aren't using your cars that often to go to offices. People are not flying that much. So there has been a gradual drawdown in investment and storage capacity of oil and gas. So the Middle Eastern countries, the OPEC countries were doing this. And right now in Saudi Arabia, it's summertime. So during summertime, you require extra amount of fossil for, for electricity generation. So even if the U.S. government wants to have Saudi Arabia and for that matter UAE to raise up or ramp up oil production, there will not be significant dent. The OPEC countries can supply around 2 million barrels a day to cover the shortfall. But if this, let's say the figure is crosses 2 million barrels a day, then global fuel disruption will be there. That is another problem. Along with this, along with this, if we go into the other impact of this is what happens in terms of the food security and the, uh, the macroeconomic stability in the Middle East because of the fuel disruption or because of the Ukraine-Russia war. And this is where the threat of Arab Spring II comes in. Why? Because in May, uh, let's, let me put the data correctly. Russia and Ukraine together produces at least 33 to 34% of the world's entire wheat production. So to my Russian friends, there's no getting away from Ukraine. Both of you are labeled together. Along with this, a significant proportion of the world's corn or the world's sunflower oil comes from the Russian and Ukrainian region in together. And majority of those products are exported to Middle East. For example, in case of Egypt, I believe at least 80% of your wheat import comes from, uh, comes from Russia and Ukraine. Same is the case for Tunisia, same is the case for Lebanon. Along with this, there is also another problem. Now, this disruption that takes place, now the Middle Eastern countries, now they're seeing is a massive rise in inflation. In 2021, inflation rates stood at 14.2%. So you say, what's the problem? Now, what has been historically seen is political discontent and inflation are positively correlated, as was during the Arab Spring. Price of bread consumption is a key ingredient whether the populace keeps faith with the government or not. And price of wheat is coming in. Now, Gulf states are coming in with a huge amount of lo loans, money, and they can bail out, but how much they can basically save the Middle Eastern countries such as Libya or Tunisia or Algeria or Morocco or for that matter Lebanon, which is heavily indebted. Now that remains to be seen. The problem is not universal because for countries such as Iraq, they are reliant on wheat export from USA, from Canada, from Australia, and they get their gas from Iran. So again, the problem is not the same everywhere. Now that brings us to the most important aspect of this. The changing geopolitics of Middle East. China has become the biggest trading partner of Middle East. And China is probably the smartest player in the Middle East. And I repeat this. They are having influence without entanglement. They are having influence without entanglement. Because some of their major BRI friends are not friends among themselves, like Saudi Arabia, like, for example, Iran, or for that matter, whether you talk about the issue about Egypt and Ethiopia, though it's outside the realm of North Africa, but again, there's massive conflict. Now, China has been basically piggybacking on the work of the United States of America and Russia. So there's a two four one power structure in the Middle East. Now we come into the ge geopolitics, the big two. The United States of America, which has created the edifice or sustained the edifice of the Middle East, the present Middle East, and number two is Russia. Then comes the invisible one, that is China, which is now becoming, through BRI, a major player in Middle East. But it is a status quo power. It wants stability. It, it wants its supply routes not to be disrupted. It wants its import of oil and gas not to be disrupted. It wants the Strait of Hormuz to be without any kind of disruption. Now, along with this, you have the regional four. So the Arabia, Israel, UAE, Qatar. Well, UAE and Qatar, we can lump in a smaller scale. And on the other side, you have Turkey and Iran. And there is also Egypt, but Egypt right now is dormant. Now, 
there's what we see over there that even in recent times, there's conflict between Saudi Arabia and Turkey in terms of pushing different ideologies. The Turkey was pushing the Ikhwani Muslimin ideology, or the Muslim Brotherhood ideology, while as Saudi Arabia and UAE were promoting a more Salafist ideology. But right now, because of change in circumstances after the Jamal Khashoggi assassination incident, Turkey and Saudi Arabia have drawn closer. Then there's the problem of the Sunni, uh, Sunni areas and the Shia crusade, because Iran is now, uh, what would I say, an emerging power. Iran considers Middle East as its backyard from the days of Reza Shah Pahlavi II. So the Shia crescent with Shia majority or significant Shia minority population present in places like Kuwait, Bahrain, Eastern Saudi Arabia, or for that matter in Lebanon, or Iraq, or Syria. Now this is the reason why Iran has been heavily involved and its outreach to places such as Hezbollah or even Hamas is also well known. Israel, on the other hand, because of its conflict with the Palestinians, have been reaching out. And as unlikely as it seems, the UAE and Saudi Arabia have become major partners, silent partners with Israel. And despite what they protest, the Israelis really don't want to pursue peace with the Palestinians. Because if you look at the history of Israel, Israel operates well when it has a well-defined enemy. The moment there is no enemy, Israel breaks apart. Because the fishes that you have in Israel, the Ashkenazis, the Shepherdis, the Yemeni Jews, the Ethiopian Jews, and the ideas of the Orthodox Jews being exempted from army service, it's no longer being exempted from army service. There's a lot of political tension within Israel. So the threat of the Palestinians, or the threat of the Arab Israeli population, that basically keep, keeps uh, many of uh, Israel's military and political establishment in line. Now we come to the most important part because we're talking about the Bangladeshi aspect. As General Munir has had already touched upon, we have uh, basically around 1.3 million expatriate population, Bangladeshi expatriate population. 18 and nearly what, and among this at least uh, 80 million, uh, sorry, uh, we have 130 million, uh, 1.3 million and 800,000 of those population that you have uh, basically, or 55, 60% of that population is in the Middle East. Let me get this right. So out of 1.2 crore population that's working outside, 60% is in the Middle East. Now, at least 2.5 million to 2.7 million alone is in the Saudi Arabia. We have officially 24 to 25 billion dollars of remittance annually. That means over $2 billion of remittance every month. Six, 55 to 60 percent of our remittance alone comes from Middle East. So even in terms of remittance, we are tied to Saudi Arabia. 80, 90 percent of our oil requirements are met by Middle Eastern oil imports, namely Saudi Arabia, namely UAE, namely Kuwait, and we are also exploring again gas uh, linkages from Qatar and other places. But again, the network needs to be there, the LNG, liquefied natural gas. And along with this, Middle Eastern countries, Gulf countries, uh, they give us bilateral uh, loans or again aid and the Islamic Development Bank is a major investor in Bangladesh. But in recent times, if you look at uh, in the Middle East, the changing, uh, increasing economic difficulty, rise of proxy war, Turkey's involvement in the Middle East which has actually fueled greater conflict because Turkey's uh, overriding concern of the PKK or the Kurds in Syria and Iraq, especially in Syria, and also the Cold War that took place, that's taking place between Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Israel on one side, and Iran on the other side. And things have been complicated further with um, the United States of America trying to rep mend fences with Iran and Venezuela to raise oil production. Which, and again, the nuclear, uh, the, the nuclear talks, which are about to be restarted, Israel is dead against it, as is Saudi Arabia. So there are many complications. And with the coming World Cup in Qatar, many more Bangladeshis have gone. This year alone, we want to send another million people to the Middle East. But what has happened is we are sending large pool of unskilled labor to the Middle East, and they send us a ready source of remittance. And that has cushioned Bangladesh from a lot of blows. But what happens when this golden goose stops giving egg? 
Because increasingly there is a backlash against expat workers in the Middle East. With rising levels of unemployment, reduction in social benefits, and the government also facing a budget deficit and current account deficit, the mood against the expatriates is getting uglier. There's a need for high-skilled labor. Low-skilled labor is being phased out with higher automation. So Bangladesh is not only being hit by the oil impact, but again, our future strain, our future flow of remittances, that can itself be disrupted. And there is also that, and this is another thing, this is an elephant in the room, there's also rumors every time that Israel always requires recognition, and Israel's drive for recognition amongst uh, Muslim uh, majority countries such as Bangladesh or Pakistan, that is often discussed from time to time. So that also adds a complicating factor. And in recent times, if I, I'm just going to wrap this up, and in recent times, there's another point that I missed out was in the Eastern Mediterranean, you have greater investment of Europe. Because right now, you have Israel, you, right now you have Cyprus, you have Greece, you have Algeria and Egypt working together in a consortium to basically uplift uh, <coughs> offshore, uh, offshore oil and basically liquefied natural gas. And you also have the Trans-Mediterranean LNG conduit, which Italy is planning to get from Algeria and Morocco. And spreading all over is the US's schizophrenic foreign policy. Engage, disengage. Disengage, engage. Contain security threats, leave them to the. And every time the United States gets a cold feet, the regional powers get even more emboldened, and they look towards countries such increasingly to China for greater reliance. But that remains a sobering thought. China's grand strategy of BRI investment in the Middle East will get also complicated. Because sooner or later, the allies that they have, the different partners that they have, will have conflicting objectives. And China will have to commit more resources and even more security forces on the ground as it requires safer uh, shipping routes, or for that matter, safer energy routes. So interesting days ahead, but we hope that the Middle East being a dynamic place, the people over there have are no, have a greater degree of peace and stability, and they do not get the bad press for which they are unfairly known. That it is a place of continuous conflict. It's a wonderful place with wonderful people, and Bangladesh has deep spiritual, religious, and cultural affinities with the Middle East, and increasingly so, economic and trading rights. Thank you. Pervis, thank you. And you very rightly explained to us the changes in the power hierarchy and the power architecture of the region. There is one other actor who is extremely active in the region is India. And it plays an active role in fostering relationship with most of the Middle Eastern countries. And as a matter of fact, in terms of remittance, India ranks number one from the Middle East, except the fact that it is currently taking a backlash from the statements of the spokesperson of the BJP, and there was a huge backlash from the Middle Eastern countries. But I think there is an effort by India to reset the relationship with the current visit of the Indian Prime Minister to the region also. But the country to watch, as Pervez rightly pointed out, is China. China's entry into the region is very steady but definite. The other country that has made a strong foothold in the region by establishing military bases outside its country is Russia. It is alleged to have both an air base and a naval base in Syria. So therefore the power dynamics of the region is in a flux, is changing rapidly, and we need to watch it carefully. But it is an interesting region to watch and a critically geostrategically important region to watch. With that, we will now open the floor to your questions and comments. Please, when I give you the floor, take the floor, identify yourself, introduce yourself briefly, and then ask a question. We would like to take in as many questions as possible. But before I do that, 
Our other speaker has a point that she wants to add to her initial statement. We'll hear her and then come to you. Yeah, uh, I'll just take a few minutes. It happens so that I speak fast and then I miss out some of the points that I have already jotted down. Uh, yeah, um, um, in fact, uh, Parvez uh, pointed out uh, how Middle Eastern countries are sort of dealing with their uh, po this uh, transition to post fossil fuel, you know, um, uh, economy. So this is something that uh, did not go uh, unnoticed by Middle Eastern um, um, sort of polity in different countries. So at least uh, when it comes to relationship with Bangladesh, uh, we know that talks are going on between Bangladesh and Saudi Arabia under Saudi Arabia's Lucas policy, where investment of from 30 billion to 50 billion, it could be as less as 30 billion or as high as 50 billion dollars in our export processing zone that talks are uh, underway since 2019. Uh, talks of investment uh, from Bahrain and UAE, these are going on and diversifying trade. So one uh, need to understand that how, eco uh, how uh, sort of Middle Eastern countries themselves, they are not depending on only oil export, but they are also diversifying their economic uh, sort of uh, uh, areas. Um, and then again, another area actually uh, I was uh, sort of pointing out that uh, very rightly pointed out that nature abhors vacuum. That is, there, there cannot be any vacuum if America withdraws from uh, international politics, uh, an area gradually being filled by Russia and China. So from 2017, China started uh, not only to sort of uh, diversify from its over-dependence on Middle East as such, Middle Eastern countries for energy dependence, but also it created relationship with four Cas Caspian nation uh, countries so that, you know, the in the China is saying there's a uh, sort of uh, this is very popular that China doesn't put it, all of its eggs in one basket so that its over dependence on uh, Middle Eastern oil uh, uh, should not be an issue so they started developing relations with other countries um, and then also another area is that um, how China buys Iranian oil something that uh, you know uh, when um, Iran pointed out that it has a PhD in the area of sanction busting that China does third country sh ship to ship STS uh, sort of purchasing of oil. So there are so many ways that, uh, you know, China is there with um, sort of uh, for a long time to stay. So for Bangladesh, uh, more importantly, that we need to tap these particular areas and particular understanding of a number of Middle Eastern countries who want to come to Asia. And this uh, entire idea of Asianization of Asia is through cooperating with each other and something that is recognized in a number of uh, Middle Eastern countries. So it is not only the countries who are selling oil, but they can see how the future may look like in, in, um, in the, in the uh, short run. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we will now go back to you. And the first question is from Ambassador Shamim. For Bangladesh. So I would focus more on the first part, which is changing dynamics of the Middle East and then look at the region in the, concept, in the, in the context of uh, conflict resolution. And here I would uh, recognize a few issues slash flashpoints, and these are Palestine, Iran, Yemen, Syria, Iraq, IS, and uh, the, the Kurdish issue. And uh, do you, any of the panelists, see, uh, notice anything that would uh, sort of encourage you to feel that things are really resolving as regards, because not many other regions have so many flashpoints in such close proximity. So do you see anything happening there that would possibly uh, indicate uh, some resolution, not eventual resolution? I mean, as regards Palestine, I don't see anything happening anytime soon. But as regards Iraq, this IS factor, uh, Yemen, the recent development, but it's steadily expanding and so many other uh, surrogate actors there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. First of all, thanks to Pips and Hakka Tribune for organizing such a uh, important seminar. Thanks to the panelists. Both of them are very good speakers and very favorite to me. Uh, my, I start from the back, the implication in ba of Bangladesh to the changing scenario of Middle East. As it came out in the discussion that we have lot of manpower in the Middle East countries. A very significant amount of uh, foreign remittance is coming from there. But really, is it enough uh, that we are, the relationship that we have with the Middle East countries? Because the Middle East situ situation is changing very rapidly on different issues. One is the Ukraine 
issue. Another is Saudi Arabia Iran relationship, and uh, sometimes the uh, relationship between UAE and Israel. So, so many factors are there. But since our uh, foreign policy is friendship to all and malice to none. So the whatever relationship is there in the Middle East countries, between the Middle East countries, that should not affect the uh, relationship between Bangladesh and the Middle East countries. Sometimes we find that our people are facing quite adverse situation in the Middle East countries, especially in the airport, and some restrictions are coming uh, quite occasionally. I personally think that it came up, the India is also first, uh, the most uh, foreign remittance they are incoming because they are sending all skilled manpower over there. So if we send some skill and skilled manpower and they take up some of the good posts, I think some of the impressions of those countries will be changed towards our country. And uh, my question to the panelists is that, do you think that our relationship with the Middle East countries on all those scenarios are good enough or we need to improve further? If it is so, how we can do that since our foreign policy is quite unique in nature, friendship to all and malice to none. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'll come back to you. Please wait. Our next question is from Nada from the Department of International Relations, American University in Dubai. Thank you very much. Uh, so throughout the whole time, I was asking myself questions, but Surprisingly, I had the answers to it. So I'd like to ask a rhetorical question, mostly about uh, Palestine, if I may. So we all know what happened uh, with Shirin Abu Akleh, may her soul rest in peace. What most of us might not know is what happened to Shirin Abu Akleh is what happens to every innocent Palestinian life every single day. Israel is the only, if I have to say, country in the world that goes against the international law. And they still get away with it. Whatever they do, I don't see anyone speaking up. And if I do, two, three countries, not more. Now, we cannot blame the people, but let me not say who we should blame. Uh, as Mr. Parvez, you mentioned many amazing things. Thank you for that. You did uh, talk about the digital platforms and how uh, many people can spread awareness and talk about what's going on. And thanks to that, most of us know a lot about it from the digital platforms. There is a little problem here is that whenever, and this is my personal experience, whenever Palestine is mentioned in the digital platform, we are always silenced. We can get blocked. We get uh, either non-Palestinian supporters to attack, but we don't get Palestinian supporters to see what we're talking about. Because the people that are in charge of social media, whatsoever it is, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, you can find a person with many followers and many uh, viewers but once Palestine is mentioned, Instagram automatically, or Facebook, or whatsoever social media it is, it automatically blocks, tries to silence the truth. When we try to spread awareness and try to speak up, this is happening in Palestine. It's been happening since 1948, and we have been silenced since 1948. So my question is, when will our neighboring countries speak up? Because this will not work. Palestine will not be free if we all stand up together as one nation, because this is not peaceful. We see countries talking about human rights, but they have no humanity to talk about human rights. So my question is, when are we going to stand up? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll come to you. I come from private sector, FBCCI. So I have to talk with business. <sighs> Middle East politics are creating complex day by day. We think Bangladesh has no ability to control the Middle East politics. So we should maintain the good relation every Middle East country for our business. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. General Shahid, you have the floor. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I'm Major General uh, Shahid, uh, former ambassador to Libya. Uh, yes, Middle East changing, but we are we Bangladeshis are changing. When I say Bangladeshis, I mean the policy, the way we look at uh, Middle East. Are we changing? Before I come to the uh, um, portion, I've got two uh, observations. Now, Maurice, then about the uh, Professor uh, Parvez was saying that about inclusion of Turkey in the conflict zone. But I, I have got experience in Libya. Yes, Turkey has brought stability to the conflict in some of the areas, like in Libya, which I myself have experienced, I've seen, number one. Number two, the uh, uh, center of gravity of Middle East is being shifted gradually from Riyadh to Ankara. Today in the morning, if you have seen the breaking news, uh, that um, uh, Turkey has agreed to uh, the proposal of inclusion of uh, Finland and Sweden in, in the NATO. But it's, it's actually not the NATO uh, business, but uh, just we have to wait for a few days. You'll find what Turkey has got out of this simple uh, signing. You just wait for a few days. So what I'm trying to say is that Turkey, inclusion of Turkey in the Middle East power game, I see in, the, in a different perspective. It, has, it is reducing a lot of conflict especially in the Mediterranean area. And there is, a, as a, a Madam was saying, that about the only uh, country which is saying about Palestinian is the Turkey itself. And uh, my last observation is that one of the major reason, rather policy makers in West, especially in America, power corridor, is the Israelis. Um, keep Israelis safe. Whatever you see, they are going to do it. Let's go to the example of Egypt. Egypt is a, one of the, you know, uh, there was a proverb that what Egypt thinks today, Arab used to follow those things. Or, uh, I mean, that's what, uh, how it used to be. Now, just see Egypt. I've seen you know, Egyptians, what they talk. They look at UAE for anything, for any, I mean, any aid or any ideas and everything. So, Egypt is one of the best example how a dynamic country and which most, most powerful country, and Egyptians are, you know, really a uh, very dynamic uh, civilization. But look at what had happened. So my coming to the question is that is Bangladesh is thinking beyond its labor market to the Middle East or is different thing? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Brigitte Manzur? Uh, actually, this is such a topic. I have so many things in my mind. <clears throat> However, I'll make it shortcut. First, regarding the Palestinian issue, I'd like to say uh, we can always, uh, you know, uh, point our mind, talk to our mind, who are the countries most vocal about Palestine issues? You'll count one, two, three countries, not more than that. Are you with them? No, not at all. So this is the situation of Palestine. If we are not united, it cannot be solved. So this is one part. So out of my experience, I come back to one of the issue. It's uh, quite a back, but it is uh, related to uh, Bangladesh and Middle East and Iran, since Iran issue came up. So I happen to be the defense attache or defense advisor to Bangladesh, uh, sorry, Pakistan, and I used to cover Iran also. So I happen to visit, and my ambassador is also here, Mr. Shamim. So I happen to visit Iran quite a number of times and it was in the year of 2007. <clears throat> so when I was talking to, you know, uh, my counterparts in Tehran, so number of issues came up. It was in the year of 2007, just remember. So there was some, you know, embargo was not in full practice, but even then they were complaining, Bangladesh is not cooperating in business, et cetera, et cetera. Then they were referring me, Mr. Afshanzani visited Bangladesh possibly 96 or 95. There was a MOU signed between Bangladesh and Iran to establish a oil refinery in Chittagong and finance, it, it was supposed to be financed by Iran completely. Then they were telling, and you have not, you know, implemented it. So what was my question, what was my, you know, answer? Then I, 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 just, I was just keeping quiet for some time, then he understood. 
And I say, certainly I'll talk it out when I go back. Then they say, look, you didn't implement what we did, but you see Sri Lanka is having one refinery, Pakistan is having one refinery, and India is having two refinery. And Bangladesh, we want to give you cheapest oil, but you are not coming with us. So this is our situation. In, I, I, again, I try to relate, then you'll uh, understand why, what I want to say. Possibly the same thing is in your mind also. In 1988, Iran-Iraq war, we were completely sided with Iraq. Okay. We are completely sided with our Iraq, and ultimately Iraq was found. Iran's only one condition was there to go for ceasefire that United Nations or world community to declare Iraq was the aggressor. And ultimately, it was found Iraq was the aggressor. Okay, but what was our position? So that's how the world is revolving, and that's how we are. That's what, I'm, that's what my, you know, question to you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm General Zahir, former commandant of National Defense College. And uh, it is such a complicated uh, topic. Uh, but I, I, I need to make some statement and then uh, some observations and then uh, ask for some clarifications. Uh, the statement, the, my first statement, it is one of the region which has been hijacked by outsiders, except for one country. It's, it's Iran. The only Iran, the, nobody was able to hijack Iran as yet. But the whole region has been hijacked by U.S. and the West. The business of Middle East is not within the control of the states of the Middle East. And, 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 uh, and the politics about Middle East, the Western politics, basically U.S.-led Western politics has been based on geopolitics of oil. We have already heard about it. And keeping the Muslims divided on many issues, civilizational fault lines, then, then Shia, Sunni, and Salafism, and, and, and all these issues. And the thirdly, after 1948, the supremacy of the state of Israel uh, in the Middle East, being the smallest country in the Middle East, who, who, who is a proxy state of the West, I will, I will always say that the Israeli security as in the interest has been given the highest priority in shaping the whole geopolitics of the Middle East. And internally, there are fault lines, very clear fault lines. These are civilizational. Even our one religion couldn't really bridge this gap. This is, the, these fault lines are on the one side, the Arabs, and then the Persian, and the other side is the, the Turkic race led by Turkey. And, and these fault lines uh, have not yet been breached. But recently, I find it's a very happy thing that Turkey, there is a rapprochement, I think, happening between Turkey and so there. At least there is a first step to that. And also recently there is, uh, this dialogue has going on for a long time, but recently we are seeing the new move to have a dialogue between Saudi Arabia and Iran also. So this is, this is uh, whether this will be allowed, whether, whether these dialogues will be allowed to be successful, we have to really see. Now what about Bangladesh? And, 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 and the, the problem with Bangladesh is we need Middle East. And we are emotionally, spiritually attached to Middle East. We are very spiritually and attached to Palestine. And we can assure you that the people of Bangladesh is always with you. We can, but we, you understand the limitations. And, and that's why Bangladesh is friendly with both Turkey, Bangladesh friendly 
with Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states and the Arab, st Arab states. At the same time, we are friendly with Iran. And, 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 and uh, we have been in the past. We, we have economic and other relations, especially migrant workers have been working in all the three segments of the country. Uh, so Bangladesh has to craft a policy uh, which I would say that very creative um, diplomatic, what I would say, sort of posture, wherein we maintain good relation without uh, being misunderstood by the other. This is, we have to maintain good relation without being misunderstood by the other. And, and, and Bangladesh, I think, is a country in a position to play a role in bringing these three blocks so, in, uh, together. I think we and our prime minister, I think in some of the YC or our forums have tried to air this also, that we, sh we should play a mediation role in, in bringing Turkey and, and so they were together and so they um, and also Iran together. And I think we could play this role. Uh, my worry is about what he said, about we are sending non-skilled people to the Middle East. But we are seeing robotization, and, and, and world is really, really moving to robotization. Because of this COVID, we have seen how robots have been used uh, in lieu of unskilled laborers and others in China and other places, in Japan and others. And I'm afraid if the Middle Eastern countries, they really go and replace these non-skilled people with robots, we have a big problem. And this is, I think, is a threat. And, and I would re ask both the panelists to comment about my observations. Can the Middle East ever come together? Will they be ever allowed to be one? And do you see any timeline where they could achieve this? Is there any sign? And, and what I said about Bangladesh. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Tanvir from Department of International Relations, Dhaka University. You have the floor. Uh, thank you. I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, I'm currently working as a lecturer of international relations at University of Dhaka. So he has already mentioned my name. Um, Bangladesh's foreign policy, which you often term in terms of a moral position, right? The friendship with all malice to none. It does have a moral aspect to it. At the same time, it does have a real politic aspect to it. So I believe we need to look into that, both of that, when we talk about Palestine and uh, Middle East. So as one of the key founding members of Al-Quds Committee regarding the independence of Palestine, um, Bangladesh does need to take a stand in regards to that. At the same time, we need to come, up, come to terms with the reality that we face. In Middle East, if we are looking to enhance our businesses, our businesses, the products that we are, make, that we are going to make, has to be up to the standard, right? Um, if Australia can be one of the key suppliers of red meat to Middle East, despite being thousands of kilometers away, by maintaining halal standards and all the kinds of health standards that needs to be done, Bangladesh, unless and until we are able to do that, Middle Eastern countries are not going to buy our products. And the kinds of uh, standard and testing institutions that we have in Bangladesh, the certificates that they're given, the products that are being made, will certainly not be up to the standards that needs to be there so for us to export to Middle East. That's number one. Second is that regardless of whatever steps we take, there is going to be certain degrees of pitfalls when it comes to the labor market. So it should be our policy to ensure that people who, ma who will be returning are integrated into the domestic economy of Bangladesh because they might be going as unskilled labor to Middle East, but they do offer us a huge opportunity to be, to be using them as, um, you know, kind of skilled labor because by the time they're returning, they have, have experiences in high technology sectors. Third is a question of how Middle Eastern states are themselves internally structured. Yes, Middle East is a new front of digitalization and digital platforms. At the same time, Middle East is also uh, one of the forefronts of digital surveillance to begin with. A lot of these digital surveillance technologies are happening in Middle East. So that would question how the internal structure of Middle Eastern states are going to be. Um, Third would be how Bangladesh engages with Middle East to begin with, because I believe some specific points need to be pointed out in regards to that particular aspect. So Bangladesh already has a military uh, position in um, Kuwait, 
as part of a UN program since the second Gulf War. I termed the Iraq-Iran was the first Gulf War to be more uh, true to the terminology. Bangladesh needs to engage into security perspectives as well. If we want certain things to come up, IR is mostly in terms of transactional relationships. We'll have to provide Middle Eastern countries with certain things that are unique to them. As um, the future trajectory looks like Middle East is going to be a bit more turmoil, filled with turmoil than it was used to be. Let me explain how. As the ambassador to Libya pointed out how Turkey has um, kind of accepted the, accept, uh, 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 the terminologies for Finland and Sweden to join, Russia would find itself far more isolated in the greater European plane due to the quagmire that they have created in Ukraine. As such, Middle East offers a plausible outline or let's say plausible route for Russia to exert influence on the global stage. They might create some issues with Venezuela in southern uh, United States, the Latin American countries, but that will only ruffle a few feathers because the United States is predominant in the Western Hemisphere. They might try to create new avenues in Africa, but that is not going to be as consequential as any forays that is being made into Middle East. So that is number one we need to understand. Second and third, we see a global trend of militarization and how securitization is happening. So that would further accentuate the already existing features in various countries. Yes, temporarily we are seeing certain degrees of rapprochement between some of the actors, but the major fault lines do exist. Um, if, I, if I take a um, quote from a fictional character in Game of Thrones, then chaos is a letter. So, Middle Eastern conflicts are going to stay because that allows avenues for both regional and extra-regional powers to exercise their influences. So Bangladesh needs to come to terms with all of these issues when we try to make our engagements there. We cannot be romantic in our approach to Middle East. At the same time, we cannot be too pragmatic. It has to be a mixture of both. Third and foremost is our relationship with Iran and with Middle East in broader terms. Our relationships with Iran is something that we need to look through how India has responded to that. We need to engage. India already has security relations with Oman. Indian Rafale planes, which are flying from uh, France, were refueled by Europe, uh, United Arab Emirates. And a lot of security engagements are going on. So I believe we need to enhance our own relative position vis-a-vis -vis certain other states if we actually want to engage in Middle East. Because super powers like United States might have an alternative out of Middle East. But countries like Bangladesh, we are there to stay. and. Even in next futures, maybe a few centuries, Middle East, given its religious, cultural, and political history, is not going to be something that is isolating to Bangladesh. We are always going to be engaged there. How we see the nature of future engagement requires a bit of soul searching, whether we have been able to properly engage with Middle East or not. Because on the cultural front, Arab culture is something that is, that is very vibrant, right? Whether we have a cultural approach to Middle East or not, whether we have a cultural outpost like uh, American cultural centers that they have to Middle East or not, we need to look into that. Without having a comprehensive approach to diplomacy in Middle East, we cannot simply be overlooked by economic constraints and simply look at cheap labor or cheap sources of um, foreign remittances because cheap things do not last very long. So I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up on that point. Thank, Thank you. Uh, next question is from Ishraq. Where is, where are you? Um, okay, yeah. all right. Uh, so I'm Ishraq, and I have graduated from Mahidul University, which is in Thailand. Um, I will be attending uh, SOAS this fall, and my interest intersects uh, Islamophobia, decoloniality, uh, which have a lot to do, a lot to do with uh, Middle East and its politics. Um, when I read the title of today's seminar, I thought it had, it would have, um, it would have included the aspect of the domestic uh, cha uh, changes in the domestic political makeup of the Middle East and how it would be uh, impacting Bangladesh's uh, domestic political uh, scenario. Um, political Islam or Islamism has, uh, has been a uh, constant feature of the Middle Eastern politics and the discussions around the Middle East, uh, but political Islam and Islamism has transformed tremendously since the Arab Spring and many Middle Eastern countries have uh, changed their policies vis-a-vis -vis, uh, how they would engage with Islamist parties and movements. Um, even the states that used to sponsor Islamism as a state policy or even the Wahhabi 
form of Islam, um, they are also setting a certain ceiling that is much lower than it used to be earlier. Um, so I want to be taking very long, so I would ask the panelists to shade focus on that uh, and reflect, for example, how the Saudi variant of Wahhabi Islam um, and the way it exports its ideology uh, to, um, to other countries would be impacting Bangladesh's political uh, scenario, especially in regards to certain... Would you be brief because we are almost running out of time? Uh, yeah. So basically, uh, my question would be how, for, for example, the Saudi variant of uh, Wahhabi Islam and its export to uh, Bangladesh, uh, possible export to Bangladesh would be uh, perhaps reinforcing a version of Islam that promotes authoritarianism. Thank you. Uh, our next, so I'll come to you, is the Egyptian ambassador. Sorry, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, General Muni. Thank you, Zofar. Thank you for the, for the panelists. I just uh, would like to cast the light on one thing only. Middle East usually is the heart of any conflict all over the world. If you are going to look what's happening in Middle East now, we should not brush our sights away from what's happening in, the, in, in Asia and in Europe. There is some prepare, pre, uh, pre, preparations now to do is, uh, is running in the, in the Middle East. The Saudi-Turkey uh, approach, the Iranian-American uh, uh, negotiations in uh, Qatar, the, even the Turkey appro approval for, uh, not approval, the consent or the agreement that they have done with this, with the with the Sweden and the Finland and Finland, which means that that what's happening in Asia, what's the conflict, the confrontation between America and China, confrontation between America and Russia, okay, there is some preparation preparation in the Middle East to pave the way for the American, okay, to settle their force there. Uh, his Excellency, the, the former ambassador in Libya, he mentioned something that it was very, it's very astonishing for me when he said that Turkey is the stabilizer power, right? Uh, yeah, in Libya. I wonder how you can say that, however, that even the Libyan now for two years, they cannot form a, a government. The Beba is, uh, is clinging to in the power away from Libya. Let's look to the Syria, what's happening in the Syria. The intervention of the, the, the Turkey in Syria and the Northeast they disturbed the whole Syria. The only part that it's, it's, it's upheaval now in Syria is just the, the Northeast. And look what happened in Iraq. They just bombed Iraq a few, a few days ago. So I don't think that Turkey is not a, that stabilizer. Plus, what if you, if you like the opportunism, the political opportunism is something, of course, that uh, I, don't, I, I do not oppose it, but the approach now between Saudi and Turkey, I think it is dictated by superpower. They don't want the Middle East to be a conflict area. They want to arrange the, the, the stability of the Middle East to face the other powers that they want to face. Thank you. Thank you, General Munir. Uh, well, uh, having heard, um, uh, it's a vast subject. I think we cannot uh, summarize it in a very brief, but I'll be very brief in asking that Bangladesh, uh, right from the very inception, uh, played a coveted role in this region. Uh, you know, if you want to stretch the region from Middle East to, to North Africa, I think Bangladesh continues to play. Uh, the leaders of Bangladesh, the authorities in Bangladesh, maintained very close relationship with most of the leaders. And that was very significant uh, in maintaining uh, the, the other relationships, be that uh, political, economic, social, cultural. Uh, the people of Bangladesh had close affinity with a number of countries, and uh, the, that is what the foreign policy of the country evolved from. It is the hopes and aspirations of the people, what they want. They, that is how the foreign policy was developed. Uh, we see that uh, 
people used to visit that part of the world. As I don't want to go whether they went for for uh, you know employment short term, how they were uh, you know not given the best of everything. Well, still I would say in number of countries, Bangladeshis are in big demand, in high demand, and uh, they they manage most of the things uh, without. I think with Bangladeshis. Uh, involvement in that region, things would have been very expensive, very costly, very complicated. Uh, this is a reality. I don't want to go into detail. I think we all know what I'm talking about. Having said that, uh, the, the present government in Bangladesh is also maintains very good relationship. Uh, just to add, I'm sure we all know about it. The, the, the two diplomats who were acknowledged as, the, as uh, given the highest award, one was from from, where was it, from uh, uh, UAE, from UAE, yes, yes, and uh, Maritime, one of our colleagues in the Maritime Affairs, he also got this recognition. Now, we have seen that uh, our, our government uh, uh, in the past, uh, I think maybe we have overlooked, uh, we were approached both by Iran and Iraq to come forward as, as it, has, it was discussed over here, whether, whether Bangladesh could meditate between the two countries, Iran and Iraq, and come to uh, an understanding. And uh, we did uh, go into it, but I think uh, we, 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 we couldn't accomplish it. That was another matter. So like this, I would say that Bangladesh has been quite involved in this region, and we have benefited in many ways, as we have discussed over here. Uh, uh, it will continue to be so. It's not, uh, I, I know people are thinking that others will take over. Well, when time will come, I think our people are also quite pre getting prepared to, to uh, accept that as a challenge. The challenges will always be there. Uh, we maintain very good relationship with, with Palestine. That has been one of the cornerstone of our foreign policy and will continue to do so. I think this has been, uh, the ambassador is here and he does understand that uh, Bangladesh uh, uh, have given special attentions to Palestine. Uh, uh, things, uh, as General Munir mentioned, that uh, recent that the development that took place between some, some BJP leaders' statement, uh, that is very interesting where India has taken this as a big challenge. Uh, in certain quarters, they, they, they have they want to, to uh, because this has become a serious problem for the region, not only for India, because other countries can't move uh, to do anything. It is between India and those countries that has to be resolved. Uh, one can say that Bangladesh can, can, can do something in this matter, but it's a very sensitive and very difficult at this stage. Uh, well, this is the general observation I have. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The last question we found. Mr. Roosh? No, from uh, her idea about my question, one thing uh, from uh, Professor Lailufar, that is about Palestine and PLO, uh, that we know in the world that PLO is the uh, legal authority and accepted uh, in UN and among the world communities. But uh, due to Iranian proxy wars, uh, Hezbollah and Hamas, they grew up in Lebanon and in uh, Gaza or in West Bank areas. And you see there are a lot of uh, clashes, a lot of uh, things happen there in uh, Israel or uh, in that areas. So, so uh, in many times, we uh, this create, uh, creates a problem uh, when we deal with the Palestinian problem in the international arena. So how do we assess it and what is your opinion? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will now go back to our speakers. Each of you can take three minutes to respond to selected questions. <laughs> and we will start with Pervez. <laughs> you, you give you five minutes. <laughs> My answers will be less than some of the questions, length of the questions yeah. people have spoken. <laughs> but that's the way of things. Again, I'm not the one to come up with a definitive opinion, but Microphone. again, each and every one, uh, yeah. each and every one over here, you have extensive experience and I can only give you my perspective. It's not definitive. Nothing is definitive in this world, except for the fact of you have to pay taxes and you have to die. And the la only definitive aspect in Middle East is there will always be conflict in Middle East. It will not change. Since time immemorial, when you see that uh, when Adam and Eve came in, Cain and Abel basically, 
the first m recorded murder, all in Middle East. It will not stop. <laughs> Number one. Good one. Won't stop. Number two, talks about Arab unity is completely a false narrative. Yeah. Because there is nothing called an Arab. Only their unity is in terms of language. And that is the language, the right written language. You talk to a person from Morocco, you talk to a person from Iraq, and you talk to a person from Jeddah, their dialects are even different. Often they have difficulty understanding themselves. The languages, are di the cultures are different, the customs are different. And again, with the, if you talk about Arabs, we think immediately they're Muslim Arabs. No, sir. The significant Christian minorities in Arab, some of the biggest leaders in Palestine, PLO, were Christians. The, the originator of Ba'ath, Michael Aflaq, was Christian. Thank you. Now, the, so again, so the, and Arabs themselves do not get along well with them themselves. Even within Palestine, you have PLO and Hamas on Western, West Bank and Gaza. The Palestinians have been betrayed time and again by the Jordanians, by the Saudis, and by even the Egyptians, all because of their own strategic interests. The Palestinians have been fighting themselves. See, these are issues that you need to make. Even within Israel, there's a, there's a certain significant proportion of people who want peace and who want a two-state policy. Not all Israelis are bad. The biggest critic of Israel is a Jew, Noam Chomsky. I'm not saying again. And the idea is that these easily coming up with these narratives is difficult, number one. Number two. When we look into this, when, because of these proxy wars that you have, Turkey is pursuing new Ottomanism. They want to sell weapons and arms and engineering. That's it. And yes, the lure of Ottomanism, those Turks of the Ottoman Empire is completely different. Erdogan faces an economic meltdown on the highest rates of inflation in the world. And he's high probability of losing elections. That's why he's looking for another conflict. In Libya, the Russians and the Turks are locked out, Khalifa Haftar against the UN-recognized government. There is a growing fight. Within Saudi Arabia, MBSs, Mohammed bin Salman's coup, we really don't know if he's going to ascend to power or how long he's going to stay in power because there's a lot of resentment within the house of Al Saud. And again, a 100-year dispensation, Saudi Arabia, which was created with Western support, that might dissipate too. See, these are many unknown unknowns that we do have to know. And either, as vis-a-vis -vis Bangladesh, I must say this, when Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, whom we proudly call Bongo Bundu, when he was basically lobbying for Bangladesh liberation, the famed Indo-Israeli guitarist, a pianist, Yehudi Mihonin, came with Israeli support. And it is widely reported that he turned it down because he said that there will be basically support for Palestinians as a developing country, as a Muslim country against colonial and Western oppression. And Bangladesh has sided with this. However, the growing reality is that on small Muslim states, majority states, there is pressure from the West, especially also by Israel, aided and abated by Saudi Arabia and UAE allegedly to give Israel recognition. But Bangladesh is already too late to the party. We are not going to get significant recognition, but what we are going to create is political instability at home. Because one of the successes over here is you ask a person in the village, he or she sympathizes with Palestine. That is another aspect of this. And if you are talking about our relations with the Middle East, it needs to be sorted out, but we don't have the power. Think about the labor abuse that goes over here. Think about the female labor abuse that goes over here. Little or no report over here. Every day we see horror stories of sexual abuse and oppression. We cannot even bring this as because of a power asymmetry. The Bangladeshis go in significant numbers in for Hajj and also for, medica, medica, uh, for, actual, for tourism in UAE. But we have not been able to leverage it. We hear stories about $10 billion halal market. Let alone $10 billion halal market. We import cows from India. If you want to expand your... Uh, Basically, halal market, you need immense amount of cow and agriculture, water and agriculture feed. Not feasible. See, these are things that you need an economic analysis for. And in terms of Bangladesh, we are saying we are going to send skilled labor. But we are a direct outcome of our broken education system. Youth education unemployment is the highest. Educated youth un unemployment is the highest. How are you going to send skilled labor? We import skilled labor from the rest of the world. Easy to say, difficult to conduct. 
and Iran can, India can get away with sanctions busting uh, policy arrangement with Iran. Bangladesh is too small. We can't even solve our Rohingya refugee crisis. How are you going to mediate between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran and Turkey? It's very good. The idea is good. We can't even solve our Rohingya crisis. And this is, this is a matter of deep shame. And somehow, the foreign policy leverage that we are supposed to have in the Middle East, it has not translated. We have the third or fourth largest Muslim majority population in the world. Somehow it has not been converted into terms of strength. We have not been able to cultivate the contacts. Securing oil at concession rates, getting some investment, and sending our unskilled labor. These are the three priorities that we have. Until unless that changes. And we cannot change this also. We cannot blame it on the government because you are also limited by your resources that you have. And last but not the least, the Middle East will continue to be a fertile ground for proxy war. Whether it's in Libya, whether it's in Iraq, whether it's trifurcation. Why? Do you know the reason behind this? Because the current Middle East is an artificial creation for the Sykes-Picot agreement. And the colonial underwriting that has taken place, that is losing steam. So in recent and in, in future, you will see greater tension in the Middle East rather than low, less tension. And that itself is the biggest problem. Thank you. Thank you, Pervez. Okay, Lalifar, you have the last say. Yeah, uh, so I... Pervis took away most of my points that I jotted down here uh, because, first of all, you know, I uh, agree with Pervis 100% that Middle East will remain as, as a focal point of proxy wars, focal point of conflicts because as he started his, uh, uh, his talk by saying Middle East itself is a construct is a, is a very Western construct and not only that the you know how the state system uh, Europe uh, went through 300 400 years of you know experimentation about political sovereignty and how to create this this is not something set in the stone this is not like something you know that uh, was given by God but this was a human creation but for Asia Africa Latin America this this part of the world we had to simply copy the system and you know, sort of adopt uh, the system. And there we can see how state system demands a kind of unification under one flag uh, uh, to uh, make ourselves to call one nation. But one state equal to one nation solution, it does not work for many of the European countries itself. So how is it? how will it work in, a, in an area where, as Parvez mentioned, bifurcated by language, ethnic differences, uh, their custom, because the way, you know, Islam entered in this part of the world through, you know, due to Sufi tradition. Here, you know, you can sing, you can dance, and gradually, as pointed out very uh, succinctly, the, gradually the, the infiltration by Ohabi uh, version of Islam, how our culture is being very, very, uh, you know, uh, very conservative. We have not seen that uh, before. Um, and uh, I'm not saying it is right or wrong. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that how we have seen a cultural transformation over time in, in Bangladesh. And one of the primary reasons of that is, is the manpower export to Middle Eastern countries. Because we thought we are sending people to earn money, but people don't only just sit there, work, go to sleep and come back home. They also bring ideas. So this is how we can see that how, um, you know, this has a long-term impact in our, in our state society relationship, in our cultural relationship, in our urban, creating a huge difference between our urban and rural people and gradually being, you know, coming to our urban centers and uh, coming to Palestine, as you can see the mood here. Um, you know, each and every Bangladeshi, you talk to them uh, in, you know, private capacity, they will 100% support on the Palestinian cause because uh, after 1971, what we went through as a nation, we understand also the plight of other people. And if you remember in 2014, there was a very famous article uh, published in The Guardian, uh, written by, by an Israeli saying that why I want, want to burn my Israeli passport because of the comment that Ayelet Shaked, then uh, Defense Minister of uh, Israel, Say it. You can search it in Google and you will find it's very uh, interesting that we often, okay, once again I'm going to say this out loud and many men here are going to be happy, that we often think that women are very peaceful, but Ayelet Chaket being a mother of two and a former justice minister um, of um, uh, Israel, she had a very potent solution to quote-unquote Israeli, so, uh, sorry, Palestinian terrorists that kill all the women and there would be no next generation of Palestinians. And this was, this was coming from a woman saying that, you know, so there will be there will be a mixed breed, and that is how you get rid of a nation. So 
once again, whether we like it or not, women are at the center of creating a nation, breeding a nation, and the next generation of teaching a nation. And that is very, very interestingly pointed out by another woman. Uh, you see, so there's a lot of currents to this 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 issue and why uh, uh, Palestine is still having a sort of um, uh, observer status at the UN uh, despite you know so many years of oppression. Uh, each country, very unfortunately, and this is going to hurt, like really hurt, that driven by its own national interest. So as long as, I mean, it goes on, and if you cannot, if we cannot make ourselves uh, valuable to the other, quote unquote, other, our causes will not be seen as, as a cause. And that is true for each and every country. Often we can be very, uh, very critical of uh, this country or that country, but we have to think what I would have done had I been in that position. I would have done exactly the same thing. You see, so this is a very, uh, this, is a, this is coming from Thucydides, you know, from Peloponnesian War 2,000 years back. This is the lesson of IR, unfortunately, when we're dealing with another state. As Machiavelli said, there is nothing called public morality, as in when I'm dealing with another state, I cannot that state to be benevolent to my interests. There is no altruism in international politics. No country helps another country out of their inner goodness, because states cannot have inner goodness. States are driven by their national interests. That is the unfortunate truth. Uh, can Middle East ever come together? No. Absolutely no, because nothing called, you know, there's not even a Muslim world. Look at, and if that, you know, how uh, countries uh, with Muslim majorities, I, I don't like to call them Muslim countries, rather Muslim majority countries, and they're all driven by their respective. Today, you know, how Turkey and Saudi Arabia is uh, friends. Uh, uh, today, how uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel, they are uh, creating a friendship. They are providing airspace and other uh, facilities. So how can you say what, ha what is going to happen in five years, ten years' time? Um, then again, Bangladesh playing an active role in mediating Middle Eastern. Uh, Parvez very interestingly sort of pointed out that we first need to take care of our own house and then pay attention to what is happening in the Middle East. We can rather create this favorable um, you know, atmosphere for others to come and invest here instead of trying to solve their uh, you know, political issues because the, the, the uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of threats to one uh, sort of issue is multiple number. And until and unless you are attached to that particular uh, society, you know the nitty gritties. Because whenever I, I visited on that part of the world, uh, even when I was in, uh, I was in uh, Istanbul, uh, someone, whenever, when, she, when he heard that I am from Bangladesh, started speaking in uh, uh, Arabic with me. And I said, no, no, I'm from Bangladesh. He said, because you are from Bangladesh, you are supposed to learn, uh, you know, supposed to know Arabic. I said, no, I'm from Bangladesh. I know Bengali. And my second language is English. He said, no. Each and every Muslim must learn Arabic. I said, no, that is not true. <laughs> that is absolutely not true. That is a perspective I, I got in the European part of Istanbul, uh, near Istiklal Zaddesi, where all the you know, uh, major, uh, that's a hip happening place, and um, you know, the Russian embassy is right there um, in the Istiklal Zaddesi. So you see, we often mistakenly think that there is this uh, veneer of connection because of religion. That's, absolutely untrue. Um, and it, it should come up more in these sort of discussions so that we can talk about it here openly and we can uh, publish it thanks to Zafar and other people get to know about it. And we need more discussions so that we do not have false apprehension of any quote unquote brotherhood. There is no brotherhood if you're, uh, you know, if you don't have anything to offer to your brother, right? So thank you, sir. Thank you, Lennifer. Um now for the concluding remarks, we'll turn to our co-host, Zafar Soban, editor of Dhaka Tribune. Uh, thank you very much, uh, General Munir. Thank you to our two panelists, Professor Lelufar and Professor Pervez, for a really rich and engaging discussion on uh, the Middle East, where uh, the Middle East stands in relation to the rest of the world today, and of course where Bangladesh stands in relation to the Middle East. I also want to thank all of you for joining us in this discussion. It was graced by, I think, at least three, if my count is correct, ambassadors from the Middle East. We've had a, uh, a, a statement in question from a very eloquent spokesperson from Palestine, and also many uh, former uh, ambassadors and other um, eminent 
um, commentators and intellectuals here from Bangladesh have participated in this discussion and really have added to the richness. I just would like to say in conclusion that for the first, you know, sort of 30 or 40 years of my life, it seemed that the Middle East was really the very center of the world. It was the center of global affairs and everything in terms of, uh, you know, if you talked about sort of proxy wars vis-a-vis -vis the Cold War and Everything seemed to center around the Middle East, and that's changed a little, I think, in the last uh, decade or so, where we're seeing the um, center of gravity in terms of geop uh, geopolitics and geostrategy, perhaps moving a little east to, um, uh, to Asia, away from uh, the Middle East. And of course, now we're seeing flashpoints come up in, uh, in uh, Europe itself, which is something which is very recent. Um, nevertheless, I think what this discussion has really laid bare for all of us is that regardless of how the center of gravity may be shifting, the Middle East remains and will always remain an absolutely crucial area for the rest of the world. Because, um, you know, uh, I think Pervez was the one who'd mentioned that uh, even though it's 5% of the world's population, there's 55% of, uh, of, of the world's petroleum reserves, 28% of the, of, of the, uh, of the world's uh, gas reserves, and that alone is going to continue to guarantee and ensure that uh, the centrality of this region in, uh, global, uh, you know, in the global imagination and in how all of us uh, uh, respond to it. And I think specifically for Bangladesh, um, we are um, inextricably tied and linked uh, to the Arab world, and many of the other speakers here have spoken eloquently to that point. We have, of course, um, cultural, spiritual, historical ties uh, to the area, and of course, uh, the ties um, much more practical beyond that. I think, um, again, using the numbers uh, given to us by Pervez in his very excellent um, presentation. 90% of our oil res uh, resources are imported from the Middle East. And did you say it was 70% of the remittances? Something like that? So something to 60 to 70% of our remittances. And we really underestimate the impact of, the, uh, of remittances to the Bangladesh economy. In many ways, it's, 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 it's far more um, impactful than any other, um, in, than any other uh, one sector, even the much, uh, the much vaunted garment sector. If you actually look at the, um, the total amount of money coming in, compared to the amount of money which comes in, the, the net amount of money which is bought in by the garment industry. And of course, the numbers, six, seven, maybe eight million Bangladeshis in the Middle East. And as this is something which uh, Professor Lalufar alluded to uh, in her final comment, it's not just the six, seven, eight million who are there, it's also the impact of those who have been there and have come back. And I don't know that we have any specific numbers or too much scholarship on that, but I do think it's a question um, worth asking, how has um, how has the uh, the uh, you know decades long relationship of Bangladeshis working in the Middle East as migrant workers and then coming back? How has that actually impacted the polity and the society of Bangladesh? How do these people vote? How do they raise their families? What values? What attitudes have they have they brought back? Have they really changed things on the ground um, beyond just uh, making the areas in which they come from more wealthy and providing um, uh, providing money and, and, and other resources? And I think you know they, they, these are really important questions uh, for us to ask ourselves. So ultimately, what I would say is that uh, what happens in the Middle East, and you know, the Middle East is five percent only of the uh, of the world's population, but as has been made very clear, it punches well above its weight, and I think come what made will continue to punch well above its weight. Um, what happens in the Middle East is central and crucial to the world, and it is especially central and crucial to us here in Bangladesh. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Zafar. And uh, before we conclude, it'll be most appropriate if you join me in giving a big thanks and a big hand to our panel speakers. Well, once again, thank you for being with us this afternoon for a very stimulating discussion on a very, very key and important issue. And before we leave, please join us for a cup of coffee or tea outside. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.